Antichrist. Tens of millions of people are on the lookout for him and for signs of the end times. When a person with this set of beliefs opens a newspaper, they are in a sense looking for the possibility that the Antichrist could appear there. There are a lot of people who believe, yes, the Antichrist is alive and prepared now to take his place in the sequence of events leading up to the end of time as predicted in the book of Revelation. You look at the fact that Europe is uniting. Uh, you look at the fact of Israel today being a nation that is in need of peace. All these things make us believe that possibly the Antichrist is alive. Whether believers think he's here or merely waiting in the wings, they consider the Antichrist an agent of unparalleled evil. He is the one who will be possessed by Satan himself. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. And he's seen as a sign of the times. We are living in apocalyptic times. Global warming and that rising nuclear threat among nations that really scare us. The whole Middle East quagmire and jihad and all these kinds of things. These are not easy times to live in. Many prophecy believers feel the end game has already begun. The focus that the world has now on the rise of the Antichrist and the return of Christ, I believe the board is set and the pieces are about to move. The Antichrist has topped most wanted lists for the last two millennia. Prophecy believers have never stopped hunting for this figure, Christ's evil opponent, Satan's human representative on Earth, Dreams. He is both dreaded and, oddly enough, welcome. There's hope in the figure of the Antichrist as well because it signals the end of the world, which signals a reunion with Jesus Christ and a perfected humanity. If you read the New Testament, uh, literally, like the conservative fundamentalist Christians would, the order will be the Antichrist will arise and, and have a seven-year reign. Christ will return and defeat the Antichrist and then initiate a thousand years of godliness on the earth. Prophecy believers fear that the tribulation, the Antichrist's seven-year reign on earth, will culminate in a period of unspeakable punishment for humankind. A great war will erupt that will bring the end, that will cause millions to perish. Worse, much worse than the Second World War that killed millions. This will kill millions more. In a very short time, half the population of the Earth is killed. So it's no wonder that some Christians have been tracking this demonic figure across history. Believers have constructed his profile using clues scattered throughout the Bible, but found primarily in the Old Testament Book of Daniel and the New Testament Book of Revelation. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Daniel chapter 7 predicts that the man will have a spellbinding ability of oratory. It'll be through his tremendous speaking ability that he will mesmerize the world. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. He's going to be a political figure. He's going to bring peace at first. Uh, he's also going to be an ecclesiastical figure because he does supplant the, the religions of the world with his own. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. The Antichrist will read scripture, he'll quote scripture, and he will do signs and wonders and miracles. For prophecy believers, the Antichrist is an arch criminal who stands accused in advance of his crime. According to scholars, he's been hunted with particular vigor in America. Some believe this American preoccupation is founded on fear. The Antichrist has been a figure that has represented fear of a changing world. A world that will change to the detriment of Christians. Few historical events have created change and stirred up millennial thinking like the discovery of the New World. 
in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, all of the world must be evangelized before the return of Christ. So if you note in 16th century Mexico, when they discover the new world, a rise in apocalyptic thought comes back, because now we can evangelize the whole world because we finally discovered it. In the 17th century, the Puritans came to the new world for economic and religious freedom, but also to convert indigenous peoples to Christianity. And yet within weeks of arriving on American soil, they were beginning to starve and they needed to begin to raid the food storages of the Indians. And it was only a few weeks later that battles broke out. And it led to the mass murder of Native Americans. There was no easier way to justify this persecution, to begin to see the Native Americans as agents of the Antichrist, to see that they were demons in the shape of Indians. Once the object of the settlers' evangelical interest, the Indians were now suspect. The problem for the old world in meeting the Indians is that we were the Antichrist. The Bible had been used to rationalize the existence of all people in all lands. So if we were descendants of Adam, then why was there no mention of us in the book? In the 18th century, the Antichrist label would spread to the enemy abroad. During the period of the American Revolution, some patriotic ministers thought that perhaps George III was uh, the Antichrist. You really find allusions to the Antichrist from the very beginnings of American history. The word Antichrist is used to describe anyone's enemy through the centuries, and it's very often used to dehumanize them and make it possible to, uh, to fight them and fight them to the death if necessary. From Nero to Napoleon, Dictators and despots have always been magnets for those watching out for the Antichrist. In 20th century America, prophecy believers set their sights on Europe, based on a long-standing fear of a despot who would head up a revived Roman Empire. There will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, and as iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. For two decades in the 20th century, many were certain that this prophecy had been fulfilled. Among fundamentalist Christians, there were a tremendous amount of fear about Benito Mussolini as a possible antichrist. Why? Because he had revived the Roman Empire, as antichrist was thought to be going to do. But even at the height of his infamy, Mussolini had competition. Among many attributes, Hitler's skill for oratory was seen by some as a sign of the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 7 predicts this person as having a great mouth, speaking great things. Revelation chapter 13 says it again. Adolf Hitler literally spellbound the Germans. I believe that he was demon-possessed. One of the amazing things about prophecy belief is its ability to survive counter-evidence. When Mussolini was killed, when, when Hitler died, uh, writers who for, in some cases, uh, 20 years, in the case of Mussolini, had been identifying him firmly as the Antichrist, simply sort of said, well, oh, never mind, <laughs> and offered a new scenario. <laughs> Prophecy believers have often turned their attention to U.S. presidents in their search for the Antichrist. For them, this passage from Revelation predicts an Antichrist who will use economic coercion to dominate the world. No one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name. His number is 666. During the New Deal period, there were certainly prophecy popularizers who saw uh, Roosevelt as the sort of uh, puppeteer, the demonic master. When the Social Security Act was passed in 1935, they said, aha, now we see the true nature of this, of this demonic system because we're all going to be given numbers just the way the Bible foretells. Decades later, the number of the beast, 666, led some to seek the Antichrist in a president who was himself religious and interested in biblical end times prophecy. One of the arguments that I recall from that period was that uh, each of uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan's uh, three names uh, has six letters, so you, you get 666 embedded right there uh, in his name. There's an element of a parlor game to uh, some of these sorts of speculations. 
There is an entertainment value, and there's often entertainment value with regard to evil and destruction uh, that's more powerful than with regard to good and peace and, uh, and the like. During the Cold War, many in the West saw the Soviet Union as an agent of the Antichrist. After its empire dissolved, some began to look at the U.S. and its role as sole superpower. But many see the American empire as beginning to manifest all the characteristics of the Antichrist. Coercive power, controlling power, unilateral power. Most of the church does not live in the United States. So many Christians are finding themselves, they would say, being oppressed by the American empire. But Antichrist fervor isn't confined to America. It's certainly true that Muslims have used the word Antichrist as justification for killing Christians and vice versa. And both Muslims and Christians have used the term as a way of maligning Jews. Uh, so there's, there's no dearth of evidence of how this term has been misused. Though the Antichrist label has been applied to the powerful and the powerless, emperors and their empires, most prophecy believers still seek an Antichrist to come. A solitary, charismatic individual who signals the worst of times, the tribulation and the best of times, the millennium. But what is the origin of the Antichrist's profile and the details of his agenda? Surprisingly, many of the most popular end times ideas in America today are rooted in the 19th century and come from the mind of an influential British evangelist. Believers vanish into thin air. A beguiling Antichrist promises peace, but instead persecutes those left behind and ignites World War III. Christ returns victorious and ushers in the millennium, a thousand years of peace on Earth. To some, these ideas may sound like fantasy, but for many here at the New Life Church, an 11,000-member megachurch in Colorado Springs, Colorado, this supernatural showdown between Christ and the Antichrist is seen as nothing less than the Word of God. The Bible says there will be an Antichrist, and I believe that there is one individual that will be um, in the end times causing everything that's evil to take place. I believe that it's probably going to be a gentleman that is going to be of European descent, that it will come out of uh, a European uh, country and that uh, will be looked upon as a man who initially has all the answers to the world's problems. The Antichrist is the, the principal uh, opponent of the Lord Jesus, uh, who will be uh, ultimately uh, crushed and defeated. My opinion is 100% scripture. Uh, the Bible is the word of God, and that's what I believe. Members of the New Life Church come to hear Pastor Ted Haggard preach about the works of Christ. He is so good! Oh, yeah! But he, like many evangelical Christians, is equally outspoken about the agenda of the Antichrist. The Antichrist spirit will be embodied in an Antichrist, and that day will be a day when the world will be in turmoil and the world will be looking for one significant leader that will draw the world together under the banner of peace and safety. Pastor Haggard's views are hardly those of a tiny fringe of Christianity. In addition to being the New Life Church's founder, he heads up the National Association of Evangelicals, 45,000 churches with 30 million members. Evangelicals belong to one of the fastest growing segments of Christianity in the country. The excitement of the prophetic system that talks about the rapture and the antichrist and the great tribulation and the battle of Armageddon, this has a kind of emotional power 
that a liberal minister who gets up on Sunday and said, I'd like you all to contact your congressperson to support House Bill 4075, you know, which is a very good bill, is going to help, help this needy group or whatever, just doesn't have that gripping powers. But this gripping end time scenario is not a 21st century evangelical invention. And perhaps more surprisingly, academics don't believe it's a first century concept either. It comes from 19th century and early 20th century Protestant evangelical preaching, which connected together a number of separate scenes in the New Testament and came up with what is essentially a new myth about the end of time. This influential form of biblical interpretation is called dispensationalism. It was the brainchild primarily of one man, John Nelson Darby, a 19th century British evangelist. John Nelson Darby's teachings uh, were called dispensationalism because he divided the Bible into various eras or dispensations, he called them. And he believed that God had worked with humanity in different ways in each dispensation to bring them along in this redemptive process. Darby's innovation amounted to a biblical super system, a way to read scripture that unified disparate texts, and in particular incorporated difficult apocalyptic books like Daniel and Revelation, which were often ignored in more mainstream Protestant churches. The dispensationalists read the Bible like a huge jigsaw puzzle, and they would take prophecies from various places, put it together to spell out what they thought was going to happen in in minute detail, included in their expectations, was a, um, a seven-year period of great judgment and persecution and horror on the earth that was presided over by the Antichrist. Now, Darby argued that the church could not be involved in it, and therefore the church had to be raptured from the scene before the tribulation began. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. According to scholars, this story conveyed and continues to convey a compelling message. For those left behind in this tribulation period, the times are just terrible. And of course, dispensationalists have been using this prospect ever since they were uh, formed in order to make the point that you don't have to go through that. If you accept Christ, you get to escape those times. Dispensationalism caught on quickly in America. And between 1880 and 1940, there were literally dozens of these Bible institutes formed all over the country. And almost without exception, dispensationalism was the perspective taught in those Bible institutes, which put out hundreds and thousands over the years of pastors and missionaries and Christian educators. The Antichrist has continued to be a vital part of this teaching, and today he stands front and center in the culture war. There is an Antichrist spirit that's always been in the world, and that is just the idea of anything to do with Christ or anything to do with Christians is bad. The Antichrist speaks to this community. Antichrist is a deceiver. He will lure, he's what I call the Pied Piper of heresy, and he will lure all unsuspecting people to the lake of fire and brimstone and away from their communities of faith. Many believers say the Antichrist's arrival is imminent. If so, what signs do believers see of his handiwork? And how is the world being prepared for his reign of terror? believers, the Antichrist is an all-too-real figure, a demonic individual who will come one day and wreak havoc. For the faithful, the approach of the Antichrist can be felt in the news of the day. The Antichrist gives the thrilling sense that those initiated into this vocabulary, into this view of the world, know more about what's happening in events than even journalists or scholars. You can look at your Bible in one hand and the newspapers in the other, and they match. For believers, there are many signals of the Antichrist's approach. According to scholar Paul Boyer, one sign is the perception of a rise in the level of evil. Wickedness, even in America, a land that 
in the past was often seen as a as the God's chosen land is now in, by many prophecy popularizers seen as leading the way to Armageddon with with the whole array of, from gay marriage to abortion to pornography. There will be terrible times in the last days while evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The state of evil or the state of wrongdoing or terror or, you know, just the uh, sin, I think does seem to be multiplying. Many prophecy believers see advancements in technology as well as centralized governmental controls as developments that the Antichrist might exploit. Today, uh, there's a much greater tendency to speak in terms of the world system that is arising, a sort of integrated world system, uh, political, economic, uh, cultural, uh, the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, global television, plastic money, credit cards, all of this is seen by prophecy popularizers as creating a system of global control, which the Antichrist will then be able to take advantage of. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. We don't want to give us global international bodies authority over all the nations in the world. And one of the reasons why is we know that somewhere down the road, there will be an antichrist that will try to use those institutions to persecute people of all faiths, especially Christians. Some believers are suspicious of the European Union and the United Nations. What could precipitate the United Nations taking sovereign control over nations would be a global cataclysmic event. Of course, we want to watch that, but that's why we evangelical Christians, we are nationalists. But perhaps it's in the economic sphere that prophecy believers see most signs of a world ripe for takeover by the Antichrist. No one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name. His number is 666. Prophecy believers have long seen this passage from Revelation as predictive of a one-world economy dominated by the Antichrist. This fear gained momentum early in the last century as economies grew more complex. Chain stores were part of the Antichrist's regime in the 1920s and 30s, which is strange because today we don't think of chain stores as being very threatening. But in the 1920s and 30s, it was the sense that the small proprietor was losing out to these big chains. The more we use technology when we buy and sell, the greater the fear of its imminent abuse by the Antichrist. People could use barcode technology to use the power of the state to deny others their civil liberties or use the power of the state to deny people their freedom of worship or their freedom of speech or their freedom to purchase things in a store without it being somebody else's business. Advances in computer tracking and identification technology are also feared as tools of the Antichrist. What happens when a person swears allegiance to him, they're given a chip, probably, that's inserted into the hand or into the forehead and that that chip will have added to it the prefix 666, which authenticates their personal number so they can buy, sell, or hold a job. But academics look to the past for the meaning of this mysterious number of the beast. They believe the number 666 is the numeric value for the name Nero Caesar in Greek. That if you didn't go along with Rome, then you couldn't buy or sell, and it would hurt you economically. Interestingly, this big brother aspect of the Antichrist is also present in Islamic culture. Though Muslims don't visually depict religious figures, the Islamic parallel to the Antichrist, the Dajjal, is often described as a short, stout man with one eye. There seems to be some emphasis on the protruding eye. Some people say it could be reference to the television screen or to the uh, computer, the internet, or, and so on. And though it may seem far-fetched in some ways, the idea of it being able to be widespread, very influential, seemingly good, yet deceptive. All these elements that are underlying the notion of the Dajjal. An antichrist who spreads a worldwide web of control. The European Union, barcode technology, and the number of the beast, all tools of his absolute domination. Whether we see these ideas as fear-based fantasies or accurate predictions depends on our belief systems. But undeniably, 
Prophecy provides believers with a form of insight, a way to interpret a chaotic and changing world. So there's a certain sense of excitement about learning the true nature of worldly events. It gives a cosmic face to all of our otherwise unarticulated worries, our concerns. If you will, worldly events are almost being pulled by the puppet strings of Satan versus God, Christ, Antichrist. But what kind of timetable do prophecy believers predict for the return of Christ and his opponent, the Antichrist? Is the formation of the State of Israel in 1948 really the end times super sign? And if the countdown has begun, how much time is left? Since the time of Christ's departure, one question has been in the forefront of the minds of prophecy believers. When will Christ return to defeat the Antichrist and usher in the millennium? Many prophecy believers search the Bible for clues to the end of time. One prophetic concept has come to dominate their calculations. The rebirth of the state of Israel is the super sign. It's the sign amongst all others that suggests, man, we are really close. In future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel. For all of its history since the 1830s, dispensationalists were predicting the refounding of the state of Israel. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. God clearly shows that the fig tree is his people Israel. He said when the fig tree puts on fresh leaves, that's what happened to Israel in 1948. Israel was not born, it was restored. It put on fresh leaves. For many prophecy believers, the rebirth of Israel in 1948 marked the beginning of the countdown to the Antichrist, the second coming, and the end of the world as we know it. They believe the generation that witnessed the events of 1948 will also witness the showdown between Christ and Antichrist. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. The things that Matthew refers to are wars, famines, earthquakes, all in a short period of tribulation, followed by the return of Christ. In response to these passages, many have set dates for the end times, including best-selling prophecy writer Hal Lindsey. Editions of the late great planet Earth clearly suggest that the end will come in 1988, so his book appeared in 1970, so he had 18, an 18-year 18 run uh, before uh, he was disproven. Nevertheless, many believe 1948 remains the start date for the march toward Armageddon. They turn their attention to interpreting how many years constitute a biblical generation. A generation would be a hundred years. 1948 was the beginning. So we are coming close to the close of this generation. And it's not that long. But as disturbing as some of these arguments may be, Hal Lindsey and Benny Hinn are merely part of a long tradition of believers who feel they are living near the end of time. In the 19th century, William Miller, a Baptist preacher in Vermont, made an end time prediction that became known as the Great Disappointment. He was virtually uneducated, he was self-taught, and uh, he came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ would return to Earth around 1843 or 1844. He began to teach this message throughout upstate New York and Vermont. This is a Millerite chart. It's a prophecy chart that depicts the end of time. It was published in 1842 for use throughout the year because he predicted, as the chart shows, that the end of time would indeed come in 1843. On the left, you have the images and the text from the book of Daniel. And on the right, you have the images and text from the book of Revelation. 
When 1843 came and went without the world ending, Miller recalculated, claiming that he hadn't accounted for the transition from B.C. to A.D. And finally he calculated, using what he called millennial arithmetic, that Jesus would return October 22, 1844. At that point, the Millerites dropped everything. They quit their jobs, they stopped working the fields, they paid off their debts. This second prophecy failure was known as the Great Disappointment because of the anguish the faithful felt that the millennium was not at hand. Nonetheless, interest in end-of-time prophecy remained high. In the latter part of the 20th century, any major shift in the Middle East could inspire millennial thinking. I remember very clearly in June of 1967, I was playing outside on a nice warm summer day, and my mother came to the front door and summoned me and said, son, this is it. Uh, get ready, Jesus is coming back at, at any moment. And uh, this was during the Six Day War, and it was her understanding on, on her reading of the book of Revelation that this was, uh, that is the, the Israeli recapturing of the ancient city of Jerusalem was the final precondition for the return of Jesus. Israel's significance for prophecy believers is not simply an issue of faith. It has political implications as well. There are a number of prophecy writers today who are very directly trying to shape American administration policy on very specific issues uh, with reference to, uh, to Israel. Dispensationalists would say that in the chaos of the Middle East, uh, Antichrist will come and make that peace. But most scholars discount the idea that some biblical super sign was fulfilled by the founding of Israel in 1948. They contend that biblical passages in the Old Testament refer to a return from exile that happened thousands of years ago. Some of the earliest setting would arise from passages like Ezekiel and Daniel that were, that were projected against times of stress. For example, Ezekiel is written against the backdrop of the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel is written during the time of the exile and their expectations for returning to the land. After the Persians conquered Babylonia in 539 BC, Jews were allowed to return to Judea, starting in 538 BC. For scholars, 1948 may have no biblical significance at all. Moreover, some say, attempts to predict or even to influence the end of time runs contrary to the nature of Scripture. Scripture itself is clear that whatever the, the final moment might be, and whatever shape it might take, it is beyond our knowing. I'm not a young man, I'm 60. I have been watching Sunday morning televangelists since I was a child. And the one thing that is true about all of them from the beginning until now is that they all say that the end is upon us. But if, as prophecy believers say, the world as we know it will someday be devastated by an antichrist who brings on the battle of Armageddon and incites horrible judgments from God, who in this scenario will be saved? And who will be singled out for the most brutal punishment? Prophecy believers say that though the tribulation the seven-year reign of the Antichrist will be the worst period in human history. They will not be on Earth to suffer through it. They will have been raptured out. Well, the rapture of the church is that moment that in an instant, uh, those who are true followers of Jesus Christ, what the Bible says, are born again, will disappear. Will be caught away into the heavens to meet Jesus in the air and will be taken to heaven. Certainly, the seeds of the rapture are in uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians when he talks about those who are alive being caught up with the dead in the resurrection. But Paul certainly doesn't delineate a kind of Armageddon, which I think is very much part of the sort of popular notion of this kind of moment. Once the church is out of the way, the Antichrist will be revealed. The Antichrist will sign a peace treaty with Israel that will last seven years. Three and a half years into that, he will break that treaty and actually occupy uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish temple and set himself up as God. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Surely the world will hail him and honor him and respect him, and at the end worship him. 
And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? According to believers, the Antichrist, though a peacemaker by design, is a persecutor by nature. This man of peace will be just like Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin came to try to improve the lot of the Soviet people, and he killed between 20 and 40 million of them. But according to this dispensational scenario, who will be left behind to be persecuted by the Antichrist? Those who are left behind are those in the more evangelical definition of the term who have not made a personal commitment to Christ, who have not accepted him. Some see an element of vindictiveness in this left behind scenario. If we think of ourselves as the faithful, then uh, we can feel even more faithful, even more secure, if we can at the same time feel that terrible things are going to happen uh, to someone else. For then there will be a great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. Antichrist would put to death all those who refuse to acknowledge him. And at that point, of course, all the Christians are gone. They've been raptured out. And so what he's doing is addressing Jewish believers who have come to faith in Jesus Christ after the rapture. And he lets go a horrible holocaust against them. What modern dispensationalists say uh, would be the worst persecution in the history of the Jewish people. And that God would then pour out horrible judgments on the earth against Antichrist, against his followers. Famines, earthquakes, wars, epidemics, all kinds of divine judgments which wipe out a third of the world's population. I mean, you just can't imagine anything worse. Scholars point out that this scenario singles out Jews for particularly brutal punishment. The Jews in this worldview are really in a catch-22 situation. Antichrist will persecute them, but also, except for a small remnant who accept the Messiah at the end of time, the unbelieving Jews will perish uh, at the hands of uh, Christ uh, when he returns. So, so the, the role of Jews and attitudes toward Jews in this belief system is extremely important uh, and in some ways uh, extremely disturbing. According to believers, in the end, the Antichrist leads his armies against resistors in a final battle in the Valley of Megiddo in Israel. The Antichrist in the Battle of Armageddon builds a coalition from all four corners of the earth with all the kings of the earth who come marching uh, with their troops to this valley of Megiddo. All the armies of the earth are ready to take over the world from anybody who believes in a, in a faith other than the Antichrist. Satan's emissary has arrived at his destiny. He stands poised to wipe out the last vestiges of resistance and take absolute control of the earth. But it is at this 11th hour that Christ returns to do final battle. Why does God wait until this most desperate moment to send his son to our aid? Prophecy believers say that the time of Christ's arrival is preordained, that his return coincides with this lowest point in our power to resist evil. After the book of Revelation's dramatic buildup, the battle is anticlimactic. Christ will slay the Antichrist and his minions with truth, with the word of God. His exact words are unknown, but according to prophecy believers, this is no metaphor. Plenty of blood is spilled. There's imagery there of the Valley of Megiddo filling to the height of a horse's bridle with blood for thousands of square miles. The Antichrist and evil are vanquished in this fantastical scenario, but some believe this interpretation oversimplifies the Bible. The true place of faith includes doubt. Now that may seem like a very strange thing to say. It's certainly something that this particular brand of evangelical Christians don't want to have heard. They want simple to easy, under, easy to understand, 100% surety on everything. But I think that that's a naive hope. It itself is a kind of antichrist. Others say that the role of the antichrist might even be constructive rather than destructive. If only we look to ourselves rather than to others we deem evil. This was the message of St. Augustine, an early church father in the 5th century AD. When Augustine preaches to his congregation on Antichrist, he says, each of you must question whether you are an Antichrist. 
That is, whether you pretend to be a Christian, but really aren't a Christian, but are really acting against the meaning of Christ and Christ's love. We should always, as the great Christian teachers have insisted, investigate ourselves to see how far we share in the spirit of Antichrist. I think that, for me, is the ultimate meaning of this legend. The controversy over the nature of the Antichrist, whether he's an external end times persecutor or a representation of an internal struggle between good and evil, is as old as the origins of the idea and may never be resolved. What is clear is that the Antichrist, feared by some, discounted by others, is once again a rising and mysterious figure in world consciousness.